Well, we're glad to be back with you again in the study of the first epistle of John. And we want to really see, and I was thinking about this through Ken's devotional talk, that John is honing principles pertaining to Christian living concerning being a blessed man. And just exactly one of the characteristics of such a person. And we begin with verse 13 of first John chapter three. First John chapter three, verse thirteen. There he says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. I think I touched on that as I ended last week, saying, Faithful brethren practicing Christianity, the blessed man, to use the terms we just studied with Ken, shouldn't be surprised when those who are motivated by the world, which we studied about also, and here he uses the same thing that he used over in chapter 2 and verse uh, 15, where he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then he defines world, remember, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and pride of life he is not of the father, but is of the world. Well, when he says, don't be surprised, my brethren, thus addressing specifically faithful children of God, when the world hates you, what does he mean world? He means those who live on the level of the flesh, who are basically sensual. They simply gratify the appetite of the flesh. They're interested in time and space of material things. Beyond that, they do not think. And thus, they're not open to revelation. That is the word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. They are simply operating on the wisdom of this world that Paul talks about to the Corinthians in the first Corinthian epistle in the first chapter or so. Um, there is a wisdom then of this world. What does he mean? It's a wisdom that is not influenced by the revelation of God's mind in the word of God. And men and women, and boys and girls who study that, the mind of God revealed and live according to it. Now, we shouldn't be surprised then when those who love the truth, live in harmony with the truth, speak the truth, and I mean the truth of the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16. And when we uh, defend the truth, that those who care nothing about that, but who are anchored in gratifying the appetites of the flesh and living for the here and now without giving any thought whatsoever to the end of these things, that they hate you. The um, development of one who loves the truth is one who seeks after the truth continually. There must be in the person who becomes a Christian a love of God's <clears throat> truth. If that's not there, that person will never really become a Christian as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. Once we become Christians because of our love, belief, and obedience to the truth of the gospel, we continue to cultivate it. Thus, we have such letters as First John and most of the New Testament written concerning how to be faithful to God as a Christian, really what it is to be a Christian in every aspect, and thus to be that blessed person. Now, he says, the world is going to hate you. Now, remember, we've talked a lot about the Jesus and his earthly ministry, trying to get the apostles ready for the fact that if you love me and follow me and believe me and obey me and do the work I called you to do, don't be surprised if since the world hated me, put him to death, of course, then they're going to do the same thing to you. Be prepared for that. Now, in our society, for the most part in America, the hate that people have toward those who love the truth and by that truth expose their sins is very rarely 
at least up to present times, been seen and people actually being attacked, <clears throat> actually persecuted physically or government used to uh, hinder them and hurt them and maybe imprison them and so on. But in this time and for many years thereafter, and since the time the Lord's church was established, there have been many, many more years that members of the church for their faithfulness have been persecuted by the world than it has if they've been not persecuted. Uh, as I've said several times, we all recognize it because there has been protection through the Constitution of the United States that people could freely exercise their religion, that this has been something that we cherish and probably far too much take for granted that we are free to practice uh, what we believe to be the truth and stand up for it and even under freedom of speech preach it without fear of persecution but in this day and time he is trying to say if you're going to be a christian and live the christian life teach the gospel expose error that which is contrary to it then don't be surprised when people hate you. Now, hatred comes today in various forms. Right. Know how much worse it will get in the future and what form it will take, we do not know. But we do know, brethren, have already gone through this. So he says, when this happens, it is testimony in verse 14 that we know this is something that no doubt in their mind. We know that we have passed from death into life. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So the love here again is to realize the need of our brethren. Uh, to seek to help them. We help all men. Galatians 6. But we especially help our brethren in Christ. They are our brothers and sisters in the family of God. First in the three sisters. Now, he describes what happens or what is the person who says, I'm a Christian, but doesn't care for his brother or sister in verse 15. Whosoever, anybody, anywhere, hateth his brother is a murderer. Now, this shows where uh, murder begins. It starts in the mind of a person, the heart of a person. And then he says, you already know that no murderer hath eternal life about him. Well, that tells us that if we're faithful to God, if we're truly blessed, then we have eternal life abiding in us. Well, in what way? We're still taught that uh, all of us must die. That's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. So in what sense do we have eternal life abiding in us? Well, as we follow the truth of God, as we practice what the New Testament teaches, then there is the expectation that every person that does that has a right to have, and that is eternal life. That's the hope that we have, Romans 8, 24, and it encourages us to press on. Most people never give thought about anything uh, concerning the day of their death. They certainly don't give any serious thought to what happens after death. There are a great many people and the younger generations who have grown up in families further removed from living by the Bible don't give much thought to things. They're comfortable in their jobs. They have good livings. A lot of them do. Some don't, of course. But many do. They live on a level in our culture and society that's far ahead of a great many people in the world. They just don't see any need for God in Christ. They're doing all right like they are. But that's even more dangerous. That's the dangers uh, that comes from materialism and having good things of this present world in abundance. It drives out the need of God. It drives out the thought of what's going to be after this life. They're in good health, and they don't think anything about uh, leaving this world. Yet, I assure you, this very day, many younger people in good health are dead right now. 
because of various reasons that they were killed by some accident or otherwise. So what is he saying? You are members of the church. You've been baptized into Christ. You have your sins, the past sins forgiven. You've been reconciled to God and justified in sight. Now, how can you pay no attention, have no compassion for your brother? In fact, just absolutely be antagonistic toward him and hate him. Because when you do that, you might as well go ahead and murder him. He's already chosen back in verse 12 to mention that's exactly what happened with Cain killing his brother Abel. And he killed him over religious matter. Cain knew what God's will was concerning what ought to be offered and sacrificed. He chose not to do it. Cain was faithful, Hebrews 11, 4. And he did what God told him to do and the way God told him to do it and for the reason God told him to do it. Now, Abel was the one that did that. Cain, of course, became angry and hated Abel for doing that. And thus, he killed him. Killed him why? Because Abel did some wicked thing? He killed him to defend himself from Abel? No. He killed Abel because Abel was acceptable to God, because Abel believed and obeyed God. And that is what the course of this world has been for those who love God and keep his commandments. Now in verse 16, hereby perceive we. In other words, here's some way I can see something. I can understand it. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. That's one of the great things about God and his demonstration of his love for us when we were yet sinners. Now remember, we left God. He didn't leave us. We left God by transgressing his will, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. But God still saw them. You know, a lot of times you think about it, people treat you badly. It's not your fault. Maybe you've done great good to them, but they still treat you badly. Most times when people like that do that, uh, we certainly don't break our necks to run over there and try to force good upon them when they're fighting us to reject it. Well, God doesn't either as far as forcing the gospel down someone's throat. But here's the point. What was the demonstration of God that he loved us even while we were yet sinners and did not care for him at all? Well, Christ died for us. So he says, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And here's what that means concerning our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, the family of God, that we lay down our lives for the brethren. And that says a lot about what brotherly love is. And it's a great comment on Christian fellowship. We talk about how that means our sharing of things between one another that are peculiar to us because we are Christians. And that's how far then one should go in the care of his own brothers and sisters in Christ. Now he contrasts it or moves into a contrast in verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. The American Standard just simply uh, does away with the antiquated uh, terminology bowels because that was the view in 1611 when the King James Version was originally translated uh, where they located the uh, source of compassion. And that's all he's talking about. The compassion that one family member has for another family member. And he's talking about spiritual family members, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the compassion they should have one for another. Now he puts it in question form. This is a rhetorical question. These brethren, and they are brethren, already understand much about godly living as a Christian. They may have undergone a number of things in persecution. But they needed to know how close they ought to be with one another when the world was so foreign to them 
not only foreign to them, but antagonistic toward them because of what they believed and what they practiced. They still were to do good. So if you don't have this compassion in you, if you're not concerned about the feelings of others, the plight of others, the hurt of others, there's something that you need to cultivate that you've left out that was very much a part of Jesus Christ. And thus we need to understand that part of the Christian character is to develop compassion for those who cannot help themselves in whatever way that is. When I think of the unborn baby who should be in one of the most secure places on earth within its mother, yet today is one of the most insecure places. It is as defenseless as anything could be. And yet where is the compassion in much of these United States that talk so much about concern for the people who don't have food to eat, who don't have this. And they talk about the rights of people. Whatever happened to the rights of that individual person that is unborn, and by the way, is not a part of its mother in the sense of its mother's physical body. It is another human being. And yet now there is no compassion on the part of a great many people. If you could develop compassion on the part of women who are beginning to think about getting rid of that blob of protoplasm or growth or whatever they think it is, they're realizing it is a little infant, little human infant, a little baby, so that you could possibly tap in to whatever compassion is left in a mother who would even think about murdering her baby, her unborn baby. You might begin to turn some people around. But false doctrine in the area of morality has concluded that that is not even a child. Now, if you were raising racehorses up in Lexington, in Kentucky, and you had a strain of horses that were winning races right and left, you could ensure that unborn colt as just that, an unborn horse. He wouldn't become a horse after he's born. He's an unborn horse, a colt, before he's born. Now, when it comes to money, people see a lot of things. But now when it comes to a human being, that unborn baby, people try to say, not a baby at all. And thus you can get rid of it. Well, that's just what false doctrine does, whether it's in the area of philosophy, morals, or religion. It causes a person to harden their hearts when it comes to the truth of what things really are. It causes you to reject the facts in the matter is what it does. And even scientists and medical theorists will do that for themselves regarding such a thing as an unborn baby. And they won't even want to call it an unborn human being or a baby. They'll want to call it by its medical terminology. So they divorce themselves from the thought of that they're killing a little defenseless unborn baby. Now, there are a lot of things that God is going to punish people for that we can't begin to grasp of how terrible it will be. But there's certainly one thing that he's going to do, and that is punish in ways that's hard. Well, I think it's impossible for us to understand for those who murder the unborn and try to teach that those unborn babies are not even human beings. Now, when you look at this, then there is that cultivation of compassion, of care, of mercy, of tenderness, of loving kindness, of favor that should go along with the child of God, developing the very character and spirit of Christ. So, but whoso hath this world's good 
and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, is not compassionate upon him. How dwells the love of God in him? So if you're thinking you're a fine, upstanding Christian and God is with you and you reflect the spirit of Christ, but you don't care for your brethren and helping them when they can't help themselves, then the love of God doesn't dwell in you. You need to start back in the very beginning and understand the very fundamentals and foundation of what a Christian really is. Then he goes ahead with these term, this term of endearment that we're used to now in reading the first letter. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Well, what does he mean? Well, it's very easy to say, well, we ought to do this. Very easy to say, the Bible teaches this. Very easy to recognize the need and confess the need. Another thing, to do what is necessary to alleviate the problem. Now, evidently, uh, brethren had a good deal of that kind of problem in the first century as the New Testament were being written. Because if you go over to James chapter 2, another letter written to Christians, he spends a lot of time on pointing out that one's faith is worthless unless they put it into practice. That is, they're obedient to God. And what does he do? He talks about those who are naked and destitute. And it doesn't do them any good to say, look at them. Look how bad off they are. They need some help but we don't do what's necessary to help them. So the compassion that John speaks of here is talked about in a different way by James. And if we want people today to learn compassion and that we might show forth the leavening influence for good, that we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, we're going to have to learn compassion. I apply this further than he did here because he applies it to the love of the brethren one for another. Well, what about God's love for those outside of Christ and lost in their sin? Should we have that kind of compassion for them that we want to do what's necessary in our lives to get the truth to those who don't know it? Sometimes that may mean that you say something or do something to especially get the attention of the person outside of Christ, of the person that we talked about a little bit ago, who's not necessarily a bad person in the sense of immoral. They're just not thinking about the need of becoming a Christian. They don't realize that they've sinned. They don't understand they've transgressed God's law. They do not realize they, their soul is in jeopardy. Sometimes it's hard to get a person like that to understand some things than it is to get somebody who's caught up with a great deal of things that are wrong and recognizes they're wrong. But the person who's in the wrong but doesn't recognize the wrong, that's another story sometimes. So we may have to do and we may have to say things to get their attention. You're about to be washed away. You remember a few years ago, of the tsunami that hit Indonesia. Those people were just going along just fine, making it great. They didn't know a great catastrophe had taken place in the form of a terrible earthquake that was going to send those waves right across and kill people by the thousands all over Southeast Asia. Well, what would we have done if we had been there and known about it? You got to act pretty quickly. You would have tried your best to have sounded out the news. Some people may have ignored you. They may have gone right on about their business. But you would have done your part and manifested your love for them and warning them of what was coming. And that's the way it ought to be with members of the church. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, but neither in tongue, but in deed what you do. Put it into practice and in truth as the truth of God's word directs us. That harkens back to whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Colossians 3.17. Christianity 
is a doing religion. If you remove the do out of Christianity, you destroy it. But that doing must be authorized by Jesus Christ, the absolute monarch over his kingdom. That's what governs us as little children in the kingdom of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And hereby, all right, now hereby means this is the way you do it. And hereby we know that we are of the truth. Is it possible for a person to not know the truth and yet know he's of the truth? Well, there are people out there who say you really can't know the truth. You can just uh, know some aspect of it, or you may be reaching for it, but you really can never know absolute truth. Well, that's not true. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Indeed, what you do. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, it can't make free unless we fill ourselves with it and comply with its terms of pardon. In believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. The Lord thereby adding us to the family of God where we grow up in Christ. Now that's what's being said right here. Some of the things that pertain to what it is to grow in the likeness of Christ. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Well, we assure our hearts because we know the truth and we complied with it. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Set them apart. Make them useful to me. How's that done? By thy truth. And then he said, thy word is true. John 17, 17. So that's what we do. When we become Christians, we embrace the truth, believe it, from the heart obey it, we become a Christian. We continue right down that line by loving the brethren. How do we know we love the brethren? We have compassion on them, and we act according to the truth toward them, and we're mindful of their needs. This is what all is involved in this matter right here. Now, we're at a good stopping point. It's time for us to stop. But I want to emphasize this. We'll move on in the verse 20, the Lord willing, next week. But let me close with verse 19 and then a prayer. And hereby, this is the way you do it. We know, we know what? That we are of the truth. Yes, you can know whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, whether you're faithful or whether you're not. And what do we do? When we see we're in harmony with the truth or what we believe in practice, we assure our hearts before him and that's the only way it works and that's the way we must keep in mind let's bow and go to our father in prayer and the class will be over our father in heaven help us to value the truth of thy word and may we have honest hearts as we learn it and apply it to our lives may we father realize how brief and how uncertain life in the flesh is but regardless of our age at this time chronologically we know that it can't be long for any of us before this life is over so help us to learn the truth live pleasing to thee here that we might hear thy good blessed son say to us on the day of judgment well done thou good and faithful servant enter ye into the joys of thy lord may we love each other and help each other to come to the knowledge of the truth and to live by it we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.